figure if somebody comes to the Taiyi from British Columbia, they pretty much sort of have a relationship. But all the readers who visited us from BC paid uh, per visit 16 cents last month. We're home free. Right? 16 cents. And at that point, as I say, you'd be free to wander around at will. And um, again, that's under $5 a month. So I'm not here to pitch for you to do that. We don't have a mechanism set up for anybody to do that, the Taiyi. So uh, while this sounds like a bit of a sales pitch, I don't mean it that way at all. What I'm saying is that, that just basic number is hopeful to me, right? If we can create a value proposition within independent media, and we can advertise that we are nonprofit in one way or another, which separates us from other media organizations out in the world that make some money. But if you could have a label that went onto your website that said, we aren't making a profit and we don't intend to make a profit, but we ask you to pay for your visit. And we were able to have a cultural revolution in this country that maybe is somehow joined to what's going on with Occupy Wall Street, that acclimated people to believing that it should cost 10 to 15 cents to visit a website we would have one hell of an independent media sphere in this country. So I think that's a hopeful fact. I don't know how we get from here to there, but since this is about the future of journalism, maybe we put that up on the chalkboard as one of the agenda items for the next five to 10 years. Thanks. Next we'll hear from Peter Klein. Peter is acting director and associate professor in UBC's Master of Journalism program. And in 2008, Peter launched the International Reporting Program at UBC. Peter's students have distinguished themselves and UBC by doing in-depth investigative television reporting in a world where funding for that kind of reporting is shrinking daily and has never been more important. Among their awards, his 2010 class earned an Emmy for Best Investigative Reporting for their documentary, Ghana Digital Dumping Ground. Peter. Uh, so I'm going to jump from local to international. Um, what my background is and what my interests are uh, are uh, in relation to a lot of other aspects of local and, and national uh, investigative reporting is international enterprise and, and investigative reporting. Um, and that really is, uh, in some ways, the most endangered species in the media landscape. Um, it, it costs a lot of money to do investigative reporting. It costs a lot of money to do it in an international context. It takes skill. Um, sometimes it takes security, because it can be dangerous. And, um, you know, despite some of the models that, that we've already heard about today, it's not something that necessarily can be done um, on a purely independent level. In the past, it was done by the corporate media, for better or worse. Um, for many, many years, uh, the major news organizations, the newspapers, the networks, spent a lot of time and money on international reporting. Um, think of the sort of heyday of CBC, of CBS News, of the you know, the Globe and Mail, the New York Times, they invested an enormous amount of money on their foreign news um, because they were extremely profitable organizations, um, CBC excluded, but the, the ones that were corporate media. Um, and they could do that. And there was a market for it, and there was an audience for it. Um, that changed 20 years ago. Uh, between then, then and now, uh, there's a 75% drop in international news in mainstream media. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons. One is political. Cold War is over. Um, you know, the Cold War was a great um, reason to do stories, right? Uh, our lives were often at stake. Cuba has nuclear missiles and they're, they're going to launch it at the United States. Um, then there's a reason to cover Cuba. Uh, the Cold War gave the gave sort of purpose to some of those international narratives that and they, they gave a sort of impetus to get them covered. There was demand by, by the audience. Um, obviously, the, the, the media landscape has changed dramatically in 20 years. You, you used to have, in America, you used to have three networks, right? ABC, CBS, and, and NBC. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of cable channels. The same thing has happened in, in Canada, where you have a number of different news sources, so obviously the, the audience has shrunk. Um, add to that the internet, the audience has dwindled to, um, in some cases, almost negligible in some of these mainstream uh, news organizations. So they simply can't justify spending the money. So where does that leave us as the audience? I want to know what's going on in the world. Um, well, that's kind of where we, we've come in. We've, we've said, you know what, this is important. It's important for us to know, um, for instance, what happens to our old laptops, what happens to our old um, iPhones. Where does all that stuff go? In the old days, 20 years ago,
ago or longer, we would have said, okay, well, let's just follow it, right? Or follow the money, right? Just follow this damn stuff. Let's, where, where, where are people collecting it? Uh, and you go to your editor and say, I want to follow that container to where it goes. And your editor would say, sure. It sounds like a story our, our readers or our viewers or our listeners would be interested in. Here's a blank check. Go do it. And you'd track it down and go to China and sit out there in plain sight waiting for you to catch it. Piles and piles and piles of, of, of old electronics being ripped apart by kids, getting poisoned, um, poisoning the water, getting at, uh, burning plastics, uh, women sitting in, in little huts, melting the, the lead tin solder and getting poisoned. Uh, you go talk, talk to a scientist who's done studies on them and you'd find that the lead levels are, are you know, 70 times higher than, than uh, uh, what's considered safe in, in breast milk and you'd all be on to a great story, right? Nobody does those stories because you got to get on a plane. Who's going to pay for that plane ticket? Who's going to pay for your hotel and your transport on the ground? Um, you go to Red Lobster. You get all you can eat shrimp for $9.99. How the hell can you get all you can eat shrimp for $9.99? How it, that it, you know? I mean, if any mathematicians are doing that, that really means you sort of follow the limit. That means a, a shrimp costs close to zero, right? Because you can literally have an infinite number of shrimp for $9.99. So how is that possible? You know, a curious reporter might say, okay, well, I want to find out. Where the hell is this stuff coming from? Well, Thailand's the main source of shrimp in North America. Let's go to Thailand, find out. How do they do it? Oh, they did it because they just cut down all the mangroves, they dug out holes, and they started, you know, doing this intensive aquaculture and able, able to shove, you know, hundreds of thousands of shrimp into, into small areas. You know, in the process, they might poison the, the land, they might, you know, run the run off into the ocean and, and kill the reefs. They might exploit labor, but hey, you can get shrimp for $9.99 at Red Lobster, so why not? Um, so the, you know, these are stories that, that are sitting out there in the open, waiting to be found. You know, this is not like, I, you know, we don't have to break into any like government uh, archives to steal documents. These are stories sitting out there. Nobody's even hiding them. I think partly because they know nobody bothers to look. Um, we've, tr we've tried to look at a different kind of model and say, well, yeah, ultimately, you do need money to do this. Um, and who has money to do this? Well, philanthropists. You can go to philanthropists and say, listen, we need some help. This is important. This needs to get done. And we'd like a little bit of support. And the kind of money we're talking about is, we're not talking about $37 million. Uh, we're talking about you know, tens of thousands of dollars, or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for major, major projects. But we're talking about small amounts of money to get pretty major stories done on an international level that just simply aren't getting done. Um, so that's. That's a model that, that has been, um, I won't necessarily say perfected, but it's been, it's been experimented with quite successfully in the, United, in the United States with domestic investigative reporting. Investigative reporting in general is the other endangered species. That's expensive. It takes a lot of time to do. Um, the cost per column inch in the newspaper or cost per minute of airtime for an investigative story is, is prohibitively expensive, the, the corporate media would argue. So they don't do it. They mostly don't do it. What's happened in the U.S. is the nonprofit sector has said, you know what, there's a handful of people who really care about this and believe in this and we're, we're going to support it. So you have organizations like Center for Public Integrity, Center for Investigative Reporting, ProPublica. ProPublica won a Pulitzer last year for a self-published story that they just published on the web. That's never, never before happened before that uh, a self-published story would receive the highest honor in, the, in American media. Um, so they have, they have been working on that model. Um, and we're trying to apply that to enterprise global reporting. Now the drawback is, and I think some of you may be thinking, well, what, who are you getting that money from, right? And, and what's the agenda? You know, people who have millions of dollars to hand out usually aren't like the nicest people in the world, right? Um, what's, what's their angle, right? Um, if they made hundreds of millions of dollars and they can sort of throw you a couple, you know, checks for ten or $50,000, um, how do they make that money? And that's a very good question. Um, I think that's a question that we should always be asking, whether it's nonprofit or for profit. Um, NBC News, NBC News was owned by General Electric for the last year. I mean, wh what was the agenda there, right? Um, you have you know major wars that were being fought with General Electric equipment. Um, General Electric had huge uh, thing, money at stake in coverage of those wars. So these are questions I think we need to ask in, in every context 
Um, ultimately, from my perspective, it's, it's, the, it's the quality of the journalists and the, the integrity of the journalists. I mean, most of the people who are on the front line doing this work are not in it for the money. They're in it because they care about doing these stories. Um, and it's really up to us, many of you in here, who are, are journalists or budding journalists, to, uh, to, hold, you know, to kind of hold a fort and say, I'm going to do good stories. And I'm not only going to investigate guys out there, I'm going to investigate my own funders and find out. You know, and, if, and if I'm feeling some sort of influence that maybe I should be doing you know, a, a story about the oil industry uh, that may be positive, I wonder like, why they're doing that. Oh, it looks like they have you know, huge investments in Chevron. Well, you know, then you have to make a decision. Um, where, do, where does your independence come from? And I think that's the same situation whether you're working for corporate media or, or philanthropically uh, funded media. Um, but that's the model that we're moving towards in, in our little program. Um, we have an international reporting program right now at UBC School of Journalism. We're growing it into a bigger global reporting center. And we really want to make um, our, our center here kind of a hub for global reporting to, to a magnet for, for like-minded enterprise international reporters from around the world to come here and, and use this as sort of a laboratory to, to experiment with different, different kinds of international reporting and uh, just to be here and, and, and be able to, to practice it. I don't know about you guys, but we're halfway through this panel now, and I'm already myself feeling very energized and excited by what is coming out of Vancouver, BC. Yes. Um, next, we've got Charlie Smith. Uh, the Georgia Strait needs very little introduction who doesn't pick it up on a Saturday or a Friday to figure out what they want to do for the weekend. But the Georgia Strait has also been winning awards for years since its inception. And under Charlie's leadership, it's won many awards. It's won eight Western Magazine awards, including Magazine of the Year. And its seventh consecutive best business article. And in 2009, the Strait won the prize for best magazine article of the year from the Canadian Association of Journalists. Charlie. Thanks, Linda. Uh, I was laughing as I was listening to Peter talk about the, the oil industry. I read an article by Peter Foster in the National Post, and it was basically kind of the underlying premise was that climate change isn't real. And I started flipping through, and I was looking for oil company ads, okay. and then, but I couldn't find any. So I came to the conclusion that, you know, often it is the case where the advertising can have an influence, but I don't know if you can hear. I've got a loud voice anyway. But sometimes uh, journalists come to this conclusion on their own. Uh, anyway, my name's Charlie Smith. I've worked at the Georgia Strait since 1994. Um, I, I laugh with Dan McLeod, who's the um, owner of the Strait. And he got things started back in 1967 with a bunch of people. And back in those days, Southam wanted to put him out of business. And then a little while later, Conrad Flack and David Radler wanted to put him out of business. And then a little later, a family called the Aspers that owned Canwest Global Communications Corp wanted to put him out of business. Um, and, and Dan has outlasted them. And uh, right now, Post Media, which is owned by some vulture funds in Toronto, New York, and Beverly Hills, is uh, doing its thing. There are other kind of big players that people don't fully, aren't always fully aware of. One is called Black Press, uh, run by David Black in Victoria, which is actually a, a very big, 20% owned by Torstar, owns a bunch of community papers, papers in Hawaii, just bought a, the San Francisco Examiner. Um, you've got Glacier, which is an emerging public, publicly traded company in BC. Um, so anyway, we're still privately owned, family business, and we, straight.com is about 1.5 million hits a month. And I'm going to just talk for a few minutes, I want to give people time to ask questions, so I'll just buzz through this quickly. When I started in 1994, basically what I did was I would try to tell people what happened. And there wasn't a lot of competition out there in that you had the daily papers, you had uh, community papers, but there was lots of room. And you could, and the other thing was the NDP had brought in this Freedom of Information Act, which was terrific because you just sent in a piece of paper and a whole bunch of documents would come back and the bureaucrats hadn't figured out at that point how to subvert the freedom of information and protection of privacy legislation. So, so you, you know, it was kind of this low-hanging fruit. You do this, you do this, and then Glenn Clark was very cooperative. You do things like the fast ferries or a stupid pipeline project to make.